the mighty red brick and Portland stone archway of Lutyens Thietval Memorial looks down on the Thietval Ridge where on the first day of the Battle of the Somme a football kicked by a Northern City star player would open the tragedy of what happened here. Thietval proved once more that dead men can advance no further. Welcome back to a new season of the Old Front Line. We've had snow here in South Yorkshire over the last couple of days and I'm looking now out across the valley where I live in Elsica at the snow-covered fields and it reminds me not just of those harsh winters of the Great War but of the times when I've been out on the battlefields when I lived there or when I've visited them when those too have been covered by snow and it brings once more that longing to return to the Western Front, to the battlefields of Ypres and the Somme and indeed beyond those places and I hope that in the coming year we'll all have that chance once more to walk along the old front line and I'll be out there I hope recording some episodes on the grounds giving them I think a little bit of extra depth that we can't quite achieve from a distance but until that's possible we shall continue together here and this year marks the 105th anniversary of the year 1916, that middle year of the Great War, which saw the two massive battles of Verdun and the Somme. And with the odd episode during the course of this year, I'm going to look back 105 years with a bit more history than battlefields to look at some of the subjects and issues connected to that year and what was happening in those key months and and link them, of course, as always, to places that we can go and visit and have some of those human stories that brings them all together. I really got a lot out of producing season one of this podcast with you last year and once again I want to thank you all for your support in listening to the podcast and to thank those new Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee supporters who stepped forward over the Christmas break when they probably should have been eating mince pies or building Lego with their family Uh, and very kindly have supported the website and the podcast and and everything that we do. Going forwards, I've got lots planned for this year. I hope to speak to some more of the excellent sort of guests that we've had on the podcast over the course of uh, the previous season. And I want to get out on the ground, as I said, not just to record the the, the sounds of the battlefield, but also to meet up with the, the many kindred spirits who walk those battlefields and talk to them about what these places mean and what they think and engage with some of the fascinating stories that I know many of them have. So to begin that new year, let's pack our virtual rucksack, pull on our virtual boots, head back to the old front line, and this week to the Somme. We're starting our walk in the village of Autuil, a small village that was just behind the British front line on this sector of the Somme, facing the mighty fortress of Thietval, which we'll be walking up and into as parts of this week's walk. The village of Autuil is on the road today from Albert, the main town here on the Somme, as you come up through the village of Avalui, over the Ancre River, the Anca, the, the main river that runs through this part of the Somme battlefields. You turn left at Crucifix Corner and climb the hill and into the village passing Blighty Valley and Blighty Valley Cemetery across to your right. Coming into the village, we'll take a little turning off to the left to the Rue d'Ambar, the the Rue, the street at the back, and that'll take us down into an area of long brick-built French, typically Somme, barns. And when I stand here and look at these long barns with their big arched doors, They're 1920s constructions, they're replacing the buildings that were destroyed here during those four years of the First World War. But when we look at contemporary images of barns like this, from villages that were behind the lines in which British soldiers were billeted, we can see that this is very, very similar. And standing here, your mind wanders a little bit, and I think of the stories of of the veterans that I interviewed back in the 80s and 90s, who often dwelt upon their times in barns, in billets like this. There they were with their mates, often just sleeping on straw, uh, alive often with, uh, with lice, which would breed incessantly in places like that. 
but this was a little haven out of the front line, a, a, an away time from the front, from the forward trenches, uh, where they could relax, they could clean their equipment, they could read letters from home, write to people back home, and they could pause and think about what they'd seen and where they'd been. And soldiers spent a lot of time out of the line, you know, as much time really away from the trenches as in them, particularly by the time of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. So their connection to places like this behind the trenches, behind the lines, was very strong and very important. But we'll leave these barns behind for the moment and take a little grass path across to our left, almost in the corner of this street, towards a wooden gate and a cross of sacrifice in the military cemetery and we'll open the gates and walk in and we'll see this is a cemetery that is very different to many of the cemeteries that people visit when they come to the Somme battlefields it's set out on a slope or Twee military cemetery was begun in the summer of 1915 when the British took over this sector of the Western Front from the French gradually we were extending our line south beyond the area of the coal fields around Lons and Luz down into these chalk downlands of the Somme. And the 51st Highland Division, which was a Scottish Territorial Division, was one of the first units into this part of the front. They named many of the locations around here uh, with familiar names of places back home in the, in the Highlands of, of Scotland. And they buried some of their dead here. There are the earliest burials in this cemetery are from units within that division. The cemetery was then used by frontline units serving in the trenches uh, beyond the village, facing the village of Thiepval and the Thiepval Ridge throughout that long year from when the jocks took over this position right up to the opening of the Battle of the Somme on the 1st of July 1916. And when that battle began, men killed in the attacks around Thiepval were brought back here for burial. So it was, in many respects, a, a sort of a regimental burial site where men killed with their unit on the battlefield were brought back here for burial. So most of the men buried in here are men whose identity is known. So it gives us a good sort of cross-section of the sort of men and the types of units that served in this sector. The cemetery remained open until December of 1916, and then in 1917 and 18, the Indian Labour Corps used the cemetery for some of their burials. This was a unit that had been formed to bring over men from India not to fight on the battlefields, not to take part in attacks, but to work behind the line or, or on the battlefield in labouring tasks. Increasingly, as the war went on, the British realised that the route to victory lay in logistics, in supply, and in the whole infrastructure behind the Western Front. And to keep that moving, to keep that working, you needed labour, you needed manpower. And we went to the f four corners, the far corners of the British Empire to bring men over. And also to China, to bring men from the Chinese Labour Corps. But the Indian Labour Corps were based in this area during that period. And they buried some of their dead and probably cremated some of their dead here as dictated by their religion. So this is an important burial ground and indeed an important place in our understanding of the role, the wider role, of Indian troops on the Western Front during the Great War. In total, there are 451 British burials here, 18 Indian, 3 South African and 1 German prisoner of war. 38 of the burials are unidentified and there are 18 special memorials to men known to be buried in the cemetery but the exact location of their graves was lost, possibly in some of the later battles, particularly in 1918 when this became part of the front line at the end of the German offensive and the beginning of the Allied offensive in the summer of 1918. But I mentioned that this was a, a different cemetery compared to some of the ones that we traditionally visit when we come to the Somme battlefields. And it's not just about the uh, involvement of the Indian troops here, but it's actually the, the geography of it, because when we stand here by the cross of sacrifice, having just come through the gate, the graves go down beneath us on a slope. They're laid out on tiers, a sloped cemetery going down towards the valley beneath it. And it's an incredible cemetery, really, in, in that respect, a place that I've been to 
and walked to on many, many occasions over the years and come here for a, for a bit of quiet away from the more busier sites of the Thiepvale Memorial or around the Ulster Tower or the Newfoundland Park. And it's a place you can come to for a little bit of solitude and reflection as you stand here, as you sit here and look out across these headstones into the valley towards the wooded area beyond. And what we're seeing here is part of the Ankara Valley, which I mentioned earlier, the, the River Onk, the anchor that runs up through here from Albert right up through the villages around Otui, Hamel, uh, and up towards Beaucourt uh, and uh, Miramont. And the site of the cemetery acts like a, a bit of a grandstand, really, to seeing this ground uh, ahead of us. And it was ground that was behind the British lines in 1915 and 1916. The village, as I mentioned, was used uh, as a billeting area for troops, uh, as a reserve area for battalions that were in the line in front of Thiepval. There were battalion headquarters in Otuil. But the valley beneath us was the approach route to come up to the front line. And the river runs through here, so there were bridges. And the most famous of these was the Black Horse Bridge, which was the main route up across the valley, over the river, and up towards the front line. So perhaps a bit of dread as you were crossing the Black Horse Bridge to go up and over to the village and beyond to the forward trenches, and then again a bit of relief as you were coming away and going over that bridge to come away to go out for a period of rest. And when you came over the bridge across the river, you arrived at Avalui Wood, this big area of woodland which we can see from where we are now in the cemetery it's one of the largest areas of woodland on the 1916 Somme battlefield it wasn't fought over until 1918 during March and, and April of that year and then again in August when uh, the Welsh division pushed through there and began the breakout across the Ankara Valley leading to the end of the fighting in this part of the Somme region but in 1916, it was a reserve area, so there were thousands and thousands of troops encamped in Avalui Wood. In fact, it, it was said that on a typical day during the Battle of the Somme, at least 10,000 men were going in and out of the wood at any given moment. It was an area of huge activity, of battalions coming up to take part in the attack, mauled battalions that had taken part in offensives were coming back for rest before they went to villages behind the lines there were ammunition and supply depots in there there were artillery positions engineer dumps men were going to and fro through this wood living in this wood all the time now one of the other reasons i particularly like coming to this spot is that one of my favorite chroniclers of the great war charles dewey who wrote uh, a memoir in 1929 called The Weary Road, Recollections of a Subaltern of Infantry. He was here with the 1st Battalion, the Dorsetshire Regiment, in 1915 and in 1916, in the lead-up to and the beginning of the Battle of the Somme. His book, The Weary Road, which is still in print, and I'll put a, a link to it on the Old Frontline website, oldfrontline.co.uk, it's a fantastic memoir of the First World War. He was a very literate man, Dewey, and he wrote some incredible accounts of the quiet period on the Somme leading up to the battle, the fighting that took place here, but also other fronts, because he went up to the Easter Front, the northern end of the Western Front around Newport, and then by the end of the war, he was in Italy on the Asiago Plain. So it gives a, an important insight into that part of the conflict as well. And to give you an inkling into what Dewey's writing is like, this is an account that he wrote of where we're standing now, just as we're standing here on the slopes amongst the dead of 1915 and 1916, looking out across these white headstones. He stood here 105 years ago in the lead-up to the Battle of the Somme when these were wooden crosses, and by the late spring the poppies were beginning to grow up amongst them. He stood here and he wrote this account of what he could see. One evening I stood here looking over the broad marshes of the Onk and the great mass of Avalui Wood beyond. There was a lull in the firing and everything was still. The sun was setting. Perhaps the majesty of nature had stayed for one moment the hand of the angel of death. The river and marshes were a sea of gold and the trees of the wood were tinged with fire. To the south were the square tower of Avalui Church and the great trees surrounding the crucifix 
at the junction of the roads, known as Crucifix Corner. Shadows were lengthening in the woods and on the marshes. A cool evening breeze blew gently through the graves of our dead. Before me lay men of many nations in their long sleep. Their names inscribed on the dark crosses of the French were full of music. They were men of the Breton Corps, sons of Morbihan and Finestre. Apart lay the grave of a man killed in the first month of the war when Ulan patrols came into conflict with small bodies of British and French detached from their regiments. Nearby were the dead of the first autumn slain in the great fight for the ridge. Beyond were the men who had died in the long and monotonous days of trench warfare, which for eighteen months had taken day by day its toll of human life, of the flower of two nations. Here were the white crosses of the British, men from every shire in England and Scotland. Officers and men lay side by side as they fell. The tall Celtic cross of a Highlander was surmounted by his Glengarry. The grave of an English officer was inscribed with the words, So long. I wondered whether these were the last words of the dead officer, or words written there by one of his comrades, who expected soon to see him again. A little way apart were the graves of the Indians, with inscriptions in a strange language, men who died on these bleak uplands so far from their homes, in faithful discharge of a soldier's trust. In the far corner a padre stood reading the burial service, while a group of men with bowed and uncovered heads stood round a new grave. Here indeed death held nothing of indignity, and all was simple and sincere. It was a scene of quiet grandeur. No king could dream of a more splendid resting place, here, above the marshes, in the glory of the evening. Charles Dewey had come to this cemetery not out of curiosity just to see the graves of the French and incidentally the French graves that were here were later moved to other cemeteries including places like Notre Dame de Lorette but also to the French plot in the Anglo-French cemetery at the Thiepval Memorial. But he'd come here because men from his own battalion were buried here and no doubt he had buried some of these men himself. And again in The Weary Roads he describes this. Here above the Onk lie many of the most gallant of my regiment, men who were my friends, men whose memory I shall revere to the end of time. Some of them were soldiers by profession, others had turned aside from their chosen avocations in obedience to a call which might not be denied. Unfaltering and unrepining, they offered their lawful heritage of full and splendid life and trod the dark highway of death without dismay. They have passed into silence. We hear their voices no more. Yet it must be that somewhere the music of those voices linger, and that in time to come it will inspire and strengthen men who in pursuit of an ideal may be called upon to make a like sacrifice. But we who have lost our friends know well that much of the richness and beauty of life passed with them forever from our lives. If we have any consolation, it is that they held their heads high in life, and that when the darkness closed round them, they did not flinch. And I think when you read that account by Dewey, it's just as strong as when he wrote it all those years ago. The sentiments that he expresses there are probably the same sort of sentiments that we feel when we come to visit these places ourselves. We're not connected necessarily directly to any of these men. They're not men that we knew. They're not parts of our family. But we have a strong bond to what they stood for and who they were. And this is what I think draws us, brings us to these silent cities of the Great War. And I would say to you, come here like Dewey of a summer's evening. Come here in a spring and hear the birds in the trees. See how nature has escaped the war and regrown, but yet here, with the whiteness of the stone, the pages of that part of this region's history is still as vivid as ever. And it's with those thoughts that we return through that little wooden gate back out into the Rue d'en Bas and walk through Autui village to the church. The whole of Autuil village was completely destroyed by the end of the war, so 
When we stand here in front of the church, this is the rebuilt church and all of the buildings and houses around us were rebuilt in the 1920s following this area being part of the classified zone rouge, the red zone, uh, after the Great War. But in recent years, the church and the area between the church green, effectively, and the edge of the village has become an area to memorialise the units that passed through here during the period of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. So on the church wall there is a memorial plaque to the 15th, 16th and 17th battalions of the Highland Light Infantry who fought in the area around the Leipzig salients just to the south of Thiepval, uh, just on the other side of Ortuil village. There is a memorial plaque and bench to the men of the 16th Battalion Northumberland Fusiliers. And just ahead of us, just beyond the church, as we go out of uh, Ortuil village, which will pass in a little while, there is a little brick wall with a plaque on it which commemorates the men of the Salford Powers, the 15th, 16th and 19th Battalions of the Lancashire Fusiliers, who were the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Salford Powers, who also fought here in 1915 and 1916. And it's the men of the 16th Northumberland Fusiliers and those Salford Powers that we'll be particularly talking about in this walk. So who were these men? What were these battalions? What was their history? The 16th Battalion Northumberland Fusiliers was otherwise known as the Newcastle Commercials or sometimes the Tyneside Commercials. It was a battalion of the Northumberland Fusiliers raised by the Chamber of Commerce in Newcastle in September of 1914. And it recruited from quite a broad spectrum of men who lived in and around Newcastle, men who were shopkeepers, who were clerks and were coal miners. And they also recruited quite a a large number of men who were players of Newcastle United football team. And this included Tommy Goodwill, who was a coal miner turned professional footballer and one of their star players. And we'll come back to Tommy later on in this story. The battalion trained at Annick Camp and then went off to Cramlington and it crossed to France on the 22nd of November 1915, coming here to the Somme and spending those long months between their arrival in France and the beginning of the Battle of the Somme in this, what was then a quiet sector, uh, in front of the village of Thiepval. The Salford Powers were the 15th, 16th and 19th battalions of the Lancashire Fusiliers, So this was a unit, a POWs battalion, that was raised in the Salford area uh, on the outskirts of Manchester at the beginning of the war. The first Salford POWs in September of 1914, the second Salford POWs in November, and the third and final one was raised in early 1915. These were raised and trained, um, and the whole process of forming these battalions came about because of Mr Montague Barlow MP, who was part of what was called the Salford Brigade Committee that uh, was a committee of men, local worthies, who brought together those from the Salford area keen to enlist and serve into these three POWs battalions. And like all of the other POWs units being formed across Britain at that time, they were told that if you join up together, you will train together, you will serve together, you'll go into the trenches together. And the resultant of that, the, the end result... Uh, the outcome of it, um, deaths on the battlefield and how that would affect a community was not really thought of or thought through at that time. Mr Montague Barlow was the MP for Salford South at the time and I think men like him sensed the pride in communities and the cohesion within those communities which led to the real possibility of POWs battalions like this being formed. So following their formation, they trained in North Wales, then Catterick, and then finally on Salisbury Plain. And and just like the 16th Northumberland Fusiliers, they came across to France on the 22nd of November 1915. These were all in the same brigade together. So the 16th Northumberland Fusiliers served in the same brigade as the 15th, 16th and 19th Lancashire Fusiliers. And they were commanded by Brigadier General Yatman in the lead up to the Battle of the Somme. So before their baptism of fire at Thiepval on the 1st of July 1916, these four battalions were in and out of the line here with Ortui, the village of Ortuil, as their base, and then going up into the front line either directly in front of Thiepval itself around Thiepval Wood or sometimes uh, in the other sector just to the south around what the British called the Leipzig Salient, which was a, a quarry 
uh, in an area where the German trenches turn slightly, forming a, a little bit of a, of a salient. So when we wander the, the rows in Otwil uh, Military Cemetery that we've just been to, we will see the cap badges of the Lancashire Fusiliers and the Northumberland Fusiliers, men from these battalions killed in the day-to-day -day activities of trench warfare. Because as we've said many times on this podcast, although there wasn't necessarily a big battle taking place, men were killed or wounded every single day units were in the line by shell fire, rifle grenades, German minenwerfers, trench mortars gas attacks, uh, trench raids, of which there were some on this front. So it was never really ever safe or ever quiet. Uh, that was really the, the myth of the First World War, that quiet sectors were really not so quiet. So having established who these units were and a little bit of their history, we'll leave the village of Otwil now and walk out on the road that heads up towards the village of Thiepval on the ridge. As we come out of the village, there's a little track, a little minor road that goes off to the left, and we'll stop here for a minute. You can take that road, and it takes you down and round the back of the much larger Thiepval Wood, which we can see just ahead of us, and it takes you down to close to the marshes of the River Onk that uh, Charles Dewey uh, talked about in his account of looking out across this ground in 1916. And it takes you to an area that was effectively behind the British lines where there's steep banks uh, where the men, for example, of the West Riding Division, the Yorkshire Territorials and the Ulster Division, two key units that would take part in the fighting around Thiepval throughout the Battle of the Somme in its early stages. And it was there that they were based. There are some photographs of field cookers uh, in the banks of the back of Thiepval Wood with the smoke of the cookers rising up above. And occasionally when you walk down there, it's almost if you can reach out and, and touch the past and smell the past when you think of images like that. It's one of those off-the-beaten-track Somme locations, which I think are very much worthy of an explore now and again. You don't often see so much signs of the war, but it's part of the ground which these men lived in so frequently. It was their route to the front line, this area... Uh, their route out of the front line, places where they ate, where they slept, uh, and where they took the communication trenches that would lead them up towards the forward front line trenches from which eventually, on the 1st of July, they would make their attack. Standing here as well, we, we can see the big mass of Thiepval Wood. It's a wood that's now owned by Northern Ireland and preserved. It's still a working wood, so it's forested and trees are cut down. Um, and an area of it has been opened up by the excellent Somme Association where they've done some archaeology there and exposed some of the, the frontline trenches and the communication trenches and, and some of the positions. But it is a wood full of trenches and positions from the First World War, probably one of the largest areas of preserved, in inverted commas, British trenches uh, on this part of the, of the Western Front. So it's good that it is now permanently preserved in the hands of Northern Ireland whose men fought here and suffered such great casualties in the Battle of the Somme here in 1916. From here we'll continue up the main roads and round the bend and as we move up this road increasingly up this slope we can see ahead of us the huge Lutyens archway of the Thiepval Memorial to the Missing. Now we'll return to that memorial for a look at it another day. It deserves at least a podcast, perhaps more than one, uh, to itself to really take in the importance of Mighty Thiepval, this memorial that commemorated 73,000 British soldiers when it was originally built who were killed on the Somme, who have no known grave. Designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens, one of the chief architects of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, what was then the Imperial War Graves Commission, it was a huge archway on which the names of the missing would be carved. And probably originally, when you look at the design of it, it looks as if it should have gone over a, a road. And there is some debate as to whether it might have been placed at Poziers originally to go over the Albert Bapome Road. There is evidence in the archives of the Imperial War Graves Commission or Commonwealth War Graves Commission uh, indicating that it was potentially going to be sited near to the city of St. Quentin, St. Quentin, it'd be called the St. Quentin Memorial. I have an atlas from the 1920s published by the Imperial War Graves Commission that calls it the Ancre Heights Memorial. 
but for reasons that we'll explain later on in the walk, it ended up at Thiepval, and it sits there, dominant on this Thiepval ridge, really, I think, inf- reinforcing, enhancing just how important a ridge line this was on this part of the Somme battlefield. So we'll continue to walk up here with Thiepval, the monument ahead of us, come up into an area of trees next to a private residence. To your left, as you walk through this area of trees, particularly in the spring and the winter, you can see the signs of German trenches. And there was part of the German frontline trench position that ran through here during the centenary commemorations of the Great War, when they cleared the area in front of the Thiepval Memorial, that exposed part of the German trench system there. And one of the pictures that I'll put on the podcast website is a drone shot I took in 2014 where you can clearly see this. But we'll continue through this wooded area, come out of the far end, and just up on our left is a British memorial. And that'll be our next stop. We've come up now onto the lower crest of the Thiepval Ridge. The memorial that we're standing by commemorates the men of the 18th Eastern Division who captured Thiepval in September of 1916. A little bit more about those shortly. But what can we see from here? It's a dominant position. We can see for quite some distance. We've got the small village of Thiepval across to our right. The ground dips down a long slope towards the edge of Thiepval Wood. Today the road from Thiepval across to saint pierre de vion and Hamel carries up over the rise near to where we can see the tall tower of the Ulster Memorial, the Ulster Tower, close to the northern edge of Thiepval Wood. The vast area of field to the right of that was where the Schwaben Redoubt was located, the huge German defensive network that defended that bit of ground. Beyond that is the Ancre Valley, and the village of Groncourt. But if we go back to 1914, the landscape then was very different. Beneath us, on that slope towards Thiepval Wood, was essentially a park, a chateau park, because just to our right was the Thiepval Chateau. Now, many people believe that the Thiepval Memorial, which is behind us now, is built on the site of the chateau, and this is not correct. The chateau was sited on this rise of ground here, with a commanding view looking down onto the wood, and beneath it was that Chateau Park. And if you look at aerial photographs of the time, and I'll put a 1916 aerial photograph on the podcast website, you can see a big circular drive that came out of the rear entrance of the Chateau and went down the slope, around past the wood, and then came round back to the Chateau itself. And this was built so that in times of peace long before the great war they could come out the owners of the chateau could come out and go on a nice little pony and trap ride through their little park and back to the chateau for drinks or thereabouts the chateau dated to 1760 it was built by charles victor pingray and that family sold it in 1826 and it passed down through a number of members of different families until in 1914 It was the residence of Raymond Marie Eugene Jacques de Burge de Breda. He was the the mayor of Thiepval and also a veteran of the Franco-Prussian War. He'd been decorated uh, for bravery and was a chevalier of the Legion d'Honneur. He fled to Nantes on the outbreak of war in 1914 when the Germans came through Thiepval and he died there on the 1st of January 1916. And his wife died sometime later that year, so they never returned to Thiepval, and the chateau was never rebuilt. And what that meant after the war was that the grounds of the chateau, the park, and the extended grounds beyond it seemingly reverted to the property of the French state because the family had died off and and there was no one to inherit the land or have the chateau and the grounds around it rebuilt. So when it came to the construction of the memorial to the missing here on the Somme and the failure to place it at Saint-Quentin or on the albert Bapaume Road at Poziers or call it the Ancre Heights Memorial, it ended up, if you like, here because this was land that was available for France to give to Britain for a monument of this size. So that's why it's now 
and has been since 1932, the Thiep Vale Memorial to the Missing. The village itself at that time, at the time of the Great War, was much, much bigger than it is today. Today, Thiep Vale is one of the smallest communes in the Department of the Somme. In 1914, it was one of the biggest because the family that owned this chateau employed a large number of people upon the estate. And if we look to the centre of the village, close to where the church is now, that's on the spot of the original church. It's, it's a slightly grander church than it was in 1914. And again, I'll put a, a couple of pictures on the uh, the podcast website of what it looked like before the war. But there were terraced houses all around this centre of the village where the estate workers lived. And because the family that lived and ran this estate died during the war, never returned, the estate workers didn't return either. So Thiepval went and became really a mere shadow of what it had been before 1914. So that despite the fact that only a mere handful of people returned to Thiepval after the war, it was rebuilt. But if you look at the houses now, you'll see that the majority of them have been built since the Second World War. Most of them, in fact, built in the last two or three decades. So in 1914, as we've said, the Germans came through here. They took this high ground of the Thiepval Ridge, They conquered the village itself, they took over control of the chateau and they had the same sort of commanding views of the ground that we've got by standing here now. They dug in, the 26th Reserve Division, which was largely a Württemberg division, constructed the defences around the village of Thiepval. They'd been here from that autumn of 1914, facing first the French and then British units in the summer of 1915 onwards, and then of course the various assaults on Thiepval, from the beginning of the Battle of the Somme on the 1st of July onwards. The two principal German regiments connected to the defence of Thiepval in 1916 were the 99th Reserve Infantry Regiment and the 180th Regiment. The 180th was from Stuttgart and they named a barracks after Thiepval, a building that is still there to this day. But on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, it was the 99th Reserve Infantry Regiment that defended this ground. They'd split the various battalions of their regiment between the furthest north defences beyond Thiepval uh, on the high grounds around saint pierre de vion across to the Schwaben Redoubts, defending the village itself, and then to the south towards what we call the Leipzig Salient or the Leipzig Redoubt. Just prior to the Battle of the Somme, the 99th had installed a number of heavy trench mortar positions close to the forward trenches and also a number of machine gun positions and the bombardment that would fall on Thiepval as part of the preliminary bombardment for the Battle of the Somme failed to destroy either the Minenwerf or the trench mortar positions or the machine gun positions, and both of these would play merry hell with the British attack here on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. The machine gunners firing something like 18,000 rounds down these slopes into the attacking troops. Having survived the British bombardment here before 1st of July, the 99th Reserve Infantry Regiment, commanded by Major Hans von Farbeck, were able to put up a good defence of Thiepval, leading to the regiment having a Thiepval battle cry. Later they handed over these positions to the 180th Regiment, and they were the ones that defended it up until its capture on the 26th of September 1916 by the men of the 18th Eastern Division, whose memorial we're now standing by. On the first day of the Battle of the Somme, on the British side of No Man's Land, the 36th Ulster Division attacked from Thiepval Wood towards the Schwaben Redoubts to the right of where we can see the Ulster Tower from where we're standing now. And that's a tale for, for another day. But its neighbouring formation included the four battalions that we spoke about when we were in Autwil Village. And that was the Salford Powers, the 15th, 16th and 19th Lancashire Fusiliers and the Newcastle Commercials, the 16th Northumberland Fusiliers. They were part of the larger 32nd Division who were tasked with capturing Thiepval Village. When you look at the operation orders for their attack, their objectives were to advance from Thiepval Wood up the slopes towards where we're standing now on one side of the village and then from Utwi Wood up towards the Leipzig salients and the ground in that area on the other side of the village, push on beyond that to the Ferme de Mouquet, Mouquet Farm, which was the local headquarters of the German units that uh, that were here, beyond that to the village of Corselet, and beyond that to the German second line, and the old adage, Bapone by nightfall, Berlin by Christmas. Not quite, but that was essentially the thought. And when you look at the pre-battle orders, 
the plans for this attack ran to over 40 pages, an enormous amount of preparation and planning and so on. And when you read it, they are absolutely sure in the belief that they will advance across this ground and capture Muke Farm in just over an hour and 40 minutes. But on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, it all went very, very wrong. At zero hour, 7.30am on the 1st of July 1916, the attack up this slope towards where we're standing now began, according to the British official history, with, and I quote, the Northumberland Fusiliers who followed a football drop-kicked by an eminent North Country player. And that links us back to an individual that we mentioned earlier in the podcast, Tommy Goodwill. Tommy was a member of the Newcastle United team. He'd been born in 1894 at Earsden near Whitley Bay, one of five children. His father was a coal miner, and by 1911 they were living in Holywell. In 1914 he'd lost a brother, and he was working as a miner in Earlsden Pit. But also by 1914 he was a football player, a very well-known football player in Newcastle United. At his first match in 1913 he'd played to a crowd of 30,000 people and he became known as the hero of the Gallagate Terraces. He continued to play into the 1914-15 season, but like many sportsmen of that generation, there was a lot of pressure on these men to set an example as eminent sportsmen, as semi-public figures. It was considered their duty to enlist and encourage others to enlist as well. So join up he did, and he was posted to the 16th Battalion, the Newcastle commercials, and came across to France. He drop-kicked that ball at zero hour, went forward with the men of his platoon, and was never seen again. He was one of many from that battalion killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, and his body was never recovered. His name is commemorated on the Northumberland Fusiliers panel of the Thiepval Memorial, overlooking the spot where he died that day in 1916. So Tommy Goodwill's football started the attack. What happened when that attack moved forward? The 1st of July was a perfect summer's morning. Perfect weather, perfect visibility, both for us, the British, and also for the German defenders. So as the men of the Salford Powers and the Newcastle Commercials moved out into no man's land, those machine guns and trench mortars from the 99th Reserve Infantry Regiment began to play their merry hell across this bit of ground. And again, according to the official history, these battalions came under a continual hail of bullets, and it stated that only bulletproof soldiers could have taken Thiepval that day. The Salford Powers, the 15th and the 16th battalions, who walked straight up these slopes towards where we're standing now, the 15th battalion, the 1st Salford Powers, lost 470 men out of 624 that went into action. So that means only about 150 walked away. The second Salford Powers had 231 casualties in two companies that moved forward in their support. The 16th Northumberland Fusiliers, who were just across to our left down towards Thiepvale Wood, so on the right of the attack facing the hill, they suffered a similar fate going forward following that kickoff. The advance was stopped by heavy machine gun fire in no man's land and the survivors took cover. Their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Ritson, William Ritson, age 49, he was the man that had raised this battalion, the Newcastle Commercials, in 1914, along with the Chamber of Commerce. And he stood there, his brigadier, Brigadier General Yatman, had had not allowed the battalion commanders to lead their men into action. They were to wait back in the trenches, let the battalions go up the slope, capture Thiepval Village, push on to Mouke Farm, and then the commanding officers could go forward and join them. But of course that never happened. Ritson had to stand there and watch his proud battalion be cut to pieces by the German machine gun fire and the mortar fire and the artillery fire. One survivor said that he stood there and cried out into no man's land, my boys, my boys, my God, my boys. And he had to be physically restrained from going out to join them. 665 men of the 16th Battalion Northumberland Fusiliers went over the top. 378 of them became casualties, and only 8 officers and 279 men walked away. So for the British that day, trying to come up this slope towards where we're standing now, 
This was an unmitigated disaster with heavy losses. The attack had failed. But despite its failure, the attack was continued to be pressed home because a party of men from the 1st Salford Powers, the 15th Lancashire Fusiliers, had somehow got through part of the German trenches and into the village of Thiepval. This group, numbering around about 100 officers and men, was seen by aircraft above the battlefields, aircraft of the Royal Flying Corps, and they reported British helmets in the village, and this led to the belief that the village of Thiepval had somehow been taken, so more men and more resources were thrown in. And really, this typically illustrates the problem of First World War battles, these modern battles fought in a modern way with modern technology, with one exception, and that was communications. If the ability to talk to these men who'd got into Thiepval village had been possible on the 1st of July, then the outcome could have been different, and the continual pressing home of attacks, that might have been a different story. But there was no way for these men to send any information back, either by runner or by pigeon or any other method. And the fate of these men really is largely unknown. It's believed that a group of them got through the village and linked up with some men from the Ulster Division closer to where the Schwaben Redoubt was located. But the story of really what had occurred with that party of men on the first day of the Somme probably did not come out for some time, possibly not even really properly during the war itself. But whatever the story of these men, come nightfall on the 1st of July 1916, Thiepval, the Thiepval Ridge, the Thiepval Spur, the ground around the village, Mouke, the German second line, all of this was still in German hands. The attack had failed. And between the Ulster Division around the Schwaben Redoubt and the units, not just the Salford Powers and Newcastle Commercials, but the others of the 32nd Division who had fought in the ground on the other side of Thiepval Village, those two formations combined had probably suffered close on 10,000 casualties in this area with almost nothing to show for it. A bit of German trench captured on the other side of Thiepval Wood, but the village and the ground around it firmly in German hands. And it would remain in German hands until the 18th Eastern Division, fighting a very different sort of battle in September 1916, captured this ground. The 18th Eastern Division, whose memorial this is, where we're standing, was a home counties division of Kitchener's army, of the new army, formed in 1914. And it's very much a, a Somme division. In one of our previous walks at Guillemont, we'd come across its other memorial on the Somme at Trones Wood. It arrived on the Somme in August of 1915 and, and occupied the high ground above Fricourt near the Bois Francais and then later in the ground between uh, Mametz and Montauban on the British side close to Carnoir, Carnoy. On the first day of the Battle of the Somme, it had taken part in the attack there. It fought at Trones Wood. It had a short stint up in northern France in the Bois-Grenier sector, and then it returned to take part in the attack on Thiepval, supported here by tanks. Tanks were 11 days old when the attack on Thiepval village by this division took place, and some tanks that had been involved in the first battle at fleurs Corselette went into action here alongside them. The artillery supported the infantry and the division attacked on the far side of the village near to the Leipzig salients, straight up through and into the area behind us where the memorial now stands and the village was captured while units over on the left flank took the far reaches of the Schwaben Redoubt. But that ground and the ground beyond the village of Thietval remained disputed ground for a large chunk of the rest of the Battle of the Somme. And by the time the men whose memorial this is took Thiepval village, there was very little recognisable as any form of village. Just a big pile of bricks and stone where the chateau had been, and a similar size one where the church had once been. Thiepval had been blasted almost to dust. We'll leave the memorial now and walk up into the village, continuing along the main road. And coming up to Thiepval church, we can see its red brick design and on one corner of the building there is a, a column that commemorates the men of the village who died in the Great War. Going up into the centre of the village, again we can see just how few houses were rebuilt in the 1920s. We can see the red brick Marie, the, the town hall, or the village hall in this case. Uh, so it had quite a, an imposing place for the new mayor of uh, Thiepval uh, to, uh, to run the village, or what was left of the village, but it was literally just a shadow of what it had once been. 
We'll go straight across this crossroads towards the village of Groncourt. And we'll end this walk just in the field, just up on the left-hand side. We'll step out into the field and we'll notice that there is a very low brick circular structure here. And this is the old village well of Thiepval, the pre-war well. The only bit of Thiepval that survived those four years of war. This once large and prosperous village dominated by the chateau with full employment, destroyed by the war, shattered by the conflict, its people scattered to far and wide right across France, and it would never, ever be the same. And when you stand here looking at this simple circular brickwork, you find yourself touching it, reaching out to the past, connecting to the Thiepval of old. A few old bricks bashed and damaged, dusty and dirty, but here they stand, looking out as a marker, as a beacon, to the events here, along the old front line. You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcor. You can follow the podcast at Old Frontline Pod. Check out the website at oldfrontline.co.uk where you'll find lots of podcast extras and photographs and links to books that are mentioned in the podcast. And if you feel like supporting us, you can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash oldfrontline, or support us on Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash oldfrontline. Links to all of these are on our website. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again soon.